Okay. Praise God, the Lord bless you is my prayer. We thank God for his presence and his power in our midst. Thank God for his graces and his mercies that he extends to us as human beings in spite of all that goes on, in spite of all that's happening in our lives and in the world, God is good. The earth is filled with his goodness and we trust in God. I greet you with the Hebrew words, Shalom Aleichem, <laughs> that is the Hebrew for peace be unto you or peace be upon you or the peace of God be with you. Let's pray and trust the Lord. Father, we want to thank you tonight for your mercy. We want to thank you for your graces that you have extended to us, the sons and the daughters of men. We, we praise you because you are the creator of the universe, but we honor you and we bless you and we glorify you because you are our father. You are our source. You are our strength. You are the very breath that we breathe and the song that we sing. Lord, I ask that you would allow me to experience the moment of the teacher. I pray that it would not merely come from me, but through me. To wit, during the course of this exercise, we may deaconess, um, Mute for me. Deaconess B, please mute for me. Thank you. Bless your heart. Uh, I pray, Father God, that during the course of this sacred exercise and enterprise, that your people will seize this moment of greatness, that we will be encouraged and challenged and charged and changed. I pray that the seeds of our future shall be watered. I pray that you will confirm your word with signs following. Educate us. Encourage us. Fill us with the hope of eternity, Lord. We thank you for the anointing to accomplish this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're continuing with the theme. Uh, really, everything in the Bible is faith has to deal with faith, trusting in the unseen, faith and trust, trusting in the unseen or trusting that the real, uh, believing that the unseen exists, that's faith. And trusting that the unseen will guide us through the unknown. Romans 7, 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's the way King James says it. And that word, word in the Greek, as two main words for the word in the New Testament. It's logos and then rhema. L-O-G-O-S, logos, could be referred to as the whole counsel of God or the whole Bible. Um, and then rhema is a specific item out of the whole that ministers to you in a very personal way. It's, it's God's word coming to you. It's God's word choosing you. We could choose a verse of scripture. We could choose a subject. We could choose a topic. We could choose a chapter to read. But rhema is when the word chooses you and it tailors itself to fit where you are emotionally, physically, spiritually, domestically, any way, form or fashion. Uh, it speaks to you personally. It identifies with your circumstances. That's rhema. And that's what we pray about. We pray that the Holy Spirit of God gets involved with the uh, with the word of as it's communicated from the mouth of the from the mouth of the communicator but then the holy spirit gets involved with it so by the time it reaches your ears god works the miraculous he does what only god does what only god can do we thank god for the human preacher and teacher but without the signature of the Father, without the signature of the anointing, without the miraculous, without God's grace and mercy taking place in the exchange of the word of God, then nothing will take place. But we thank God for a word from God, not just the word of God, but a word from God. And a word from God, the word of God is general. The, a word from God is specific. And I tell you what we need in this hour is a word from God. You know what's important about a word from God? Because a word from God is like a sound from heaven. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. 
And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. That's what we need in this hour. We need a sound from heaven. Jesus said in the Gospels and in the book of Revelation, who has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. Not what the Spirit has said or what, what, what the Spirit will say, but what the Spirit is saying. Again, I make the statement, it's challenging and encouraging to know God has spoken. It is encouraging to know God will speak. But it's quite challenging to know that God is speaking right now. And God is speaking specifically and individually and particularly regarding you. So um, that's why we want to keep our ears open for what God is saying to us right now. Tonight's class, faith is a verb. Faith is a verb. Verb just means an action word. An action word, not a word that stands still. It is an action word. An action word is a word that does something. It is active. So tonight's class, faith, faith is a verb. So um, we're, we're, class means learning, class means teaching, class means um, repetition, class means going over stuff, class means knowledge and information. So let's go to Romans chapter 12. I, I, I kind of quote this often, but let's, let's go to Romans chapter 12. Let's begin there tonight. Of course, our base Base scriptures are Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Those are our main scriptures. And actually Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 27, which really defines faith in a powerful way, seeing him who is invisible. That's, 11, that's Hebrews 11 and verse 27. Seeing him who is invisible is an excellent definition, definition of faith. Seeing the invisible. Which, which sounds like a contradiction and a paradox. You can't, how can you see something that's not there or, or see something that is invisible? Well, faith has eyes, amen? So we're not limited to our physical senses, but we thank God for, we may call it, as I heard someone call it, the sixth sense. And that sixth sense, we have five physical senses, but that sixth sense, we have seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, tasting. But then there's that sixth sense, which is called faith, which can see the unseeable and know the unknowable in the natural. Romans chapter 12, I'm going to read from the New King James. Romans chapter 12. Tonight's lesson is faith is a verb. Uh, I want to emphasize a word here in, in Romans chapter 12. Beginning with verse one, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I want to move right into the lesson tonight. I'm not going to review much of what we dealt with last week because I have the tendency to just stay there. But let's just move on with tonight's class. I beseech you, therefore, New King James, New King James Version. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, it could say everybody. I beseech you, therefore, everyone, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. The idea of presenting your bodies it simply means your whole person. So it means your body, that's your physical part, your, your spirit, that's your eternal part, the part that reaches out to God, and then your soul, your, your, your suke in Greek, your, your psychic, your, your mind, your will, your psyche, your mind, your will, your emotions. That's what makes you, you. It's your soul that gives you your personality. Um, your spirit really gives you life. That's what comes from God. I mean, all of it comes from God, but that spirit part of you is the part that really reaches out to God, that worships God. Paul said in one of his letters that I worship God with my spirit. And Jesus said in John 4, those who worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. The previous verse would emphasize God is a spirit. So he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, your whole person, as a living sacrifice. Notice living sacrifice. So that word sacrifice means something that you give over, you give over to death. In other words, we're going to touch this word will, 
but it's when a sacrifice was offered, obviously the sacrifice um, gave its life. Well, it was the, the, the sacrifice was giving life. So the idea is we, we as, as children of God, as sons and daughters of God, it is God's purpose that we, we be alive to certain things and dead to other things. And of course, I guess you can think in your mind what the Lord would want us to be dead to, like uh, unbelief, sin, unforgiveness, not walking in love, backbiting, all those, all those synonyms that speak of the negative that's outside of the will of God that we don't want to function in anyway. It's good to walk in love. It's good to walk in faith. It's good to walk in holiness. It's good to have a good conscience. And thank God, he says, I beseech you by the mercies of God, because if we happen to mess up, thank God for his mercy. We define mercy sometimes as a restraining order. Mercy as a restraining order. I like to call it protective custody. But mercy in the Old Testament has said in Hebrew, H-E-S-E-D, it means God's unfailing love. So whenever you think of mercy, think of God's love. It is, it is his unfailing love or his faithful love. Mercy is a restraining order that holds back the wrath of God. Because of his mercy, he kept us. And his mercy also frees us from some of the penalties that we should have received. So grace and mercy work hand in hand because grace gives us what we don't deserve. Mercy protects us from what we do deserve. So let's read the verse again. I beseech you, this is Paul speaking, I beseech you. I'm an admonishing you, I'm calling you forward. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm stimulating you and challenging you by the mercies of God. So when we consider what we would be and where we would be if it had not been for God's mercy, it's an encouragement to present our whole person to God as a living sacrifice. And this is how he defines the living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now he's calling it a sacrifice because when they sacrificed in the Old Testament, the sacrifice was to was was a holy represent, representation of worship to God. So you had sacrifices, animal sacrifices that were not supposed to have blemishes, that were supposed to be as perfect as possible. Holy, holy means that the, the sacrifice that is being offered, holy means it has been separated for that purpose. So that, that word holiness is not a scary word. It just means separated separated for the service of deity. That's a powerful designation. That's what you are. You're a consecrated one. That's what saint means. You are made holy. You are separate. You know what holiness also means? It means you are special. Holiness means you become something that only God can make you. Wow, that's good. You are something that the world cannot make you. You have something that the world cannot give you. And you have something that the world can't take away. You may not use it. You may not fully understand it. But all of it comes from God. I like that. Holiness means you, it comes from God. When you are made holy, that means he has done something in you that only God can do. So he says it's holy and acceptable to God. This is the way King James and New King James says it, which is your reasonable service. I like, that's why I like King James and, and, and um, New King James sometimes because of the words that you can kind of flower out um, into supporting derivatives of that word. Reasonable makes sense because when you consider the mercy of God, the mercy that God has had upon your life, when you consider all those things, it becomes reasonable to say, Lord, I'm sacrificing my life. The songwriter said, I, I, I give myself away to you. Um, I, I, I want you to use me. I want your will to be done in my life. That's reasonable. 
but actually one of the derivatives of the word reasonable in the Greek is spiritual. That's a good designation. That's a good definition. So, so let's say it this way, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy or set apart, or specially saved for the use for the use and the purpose of deity, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual. Now here comes, here comes the next word, which is your spiritual, King James and New King James says service. But many of the derivatives of the word or one of the derivatives of the word service means worship. That's, that's often why we say we are going to service. So we're gonna have service. We're gonna engage in worship. So this really takes on a very powerful understanding. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Give yourself to God. Lord, whatever you created me for, that's what I want to become. It's holy, I'm separate, I'm special. And you accept this because only you, only God can please God. So he does in us and for us. He does for us and he works in us that which pleases him. And, and our, our walking in faith and our trusting that pleases God. And as we, as we use as a, as a base verse, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, those who come to God, those who come to God in worship, those who come to God in service, those who come to God in prayer, those who come to God expressing their needs, those who come to God simply fellowshipping and, and, and relating to God in communion and, and, and enjoying his presence. As the catechism says, the chief end of the human race is to adore the Lord and enjoy him forever. Yeah, God wants you to enjoy his presence. In fact, Psalm 149, verse three and four, let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and the harp for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He beautifies the meek with salvation. Can you think about that for a moment? The Lord is happy for you. He enjoys your company. Oh man, that's a good word. Can you just turn to somebody and tell them and encourage them right now and say, listen, sister, listen, brother, the Lord enjoys your company. That's good. We need that encouragement. That's Psalm 149 and verse three, four. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. We, we don't hear that enough because we're always thinking often, well, I shouldn't say we're always thinking, but often, the picture is judgment and God is mad at you and you better stay away from sin and, you know, just always sin and judgment. We, we are encouraged to come into his presence. <laughs> Amen. To, to enjoy him. Let the Lord speak to us tonight. My, my, my. Psalm 100 says, make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise. Did you hear me? Don't let the devil lie to you. Make a joyful noise. It doesn't matter whether you can sing or not. Whatever you got in that voice of yours, give it to him. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. <laughs> Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. You might as well lift your hands to the Lord and enjoy his presence and say, Lord, I enjoy you. Yeah, yeah. So this is acceptable to God, um, Romans 12 and 1 again, the latter part, which is your reasonable service or your spiritual worship. Verse two, and be not conformed to this world. Remember, we dealt with this last week. Be not conformed. Why does he say be not conformed? Because when you conform, you don't change. When, you're co when you conform, you do, you're, you're acting like everybody else, walking like everybody else, thinking like everybody else. There's no change. There's no change. And let me tell you something. You are the most changed if you belong to God and you accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you are the most dramatically changed person on the planet. Did you hear what I just said? Because 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation, not modified or fixed over, not the latest model, beloved, a new creation, kainos in Greek, 
That means something that never existed before that time. You ought to look at somebody and say, don't even look at me strange. I'm new. I'm new. Yeah, but I remember when you, yeah, but you ain't got to remember. That person no longer exists. Go back to where that person used to be and you ain't going to find him. You know why? Because I'm a new creation. Yeah, but I remember the family you were born into. I remember how you used to act. Yeah, but you know what? That person does not exist anymore. So slow your roll and don't even try to identify me with my past. Amen. Don't try to identify me with what negative past you remember. Because if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Old things are passed away. And I wish I had some help right now, but all things have become new. And then it says, all these new things are of God who has reconciled us and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. You know what that means? It gets so good to you. It's got the change that God did in your life is so good to you and so real to you that you can't help but share it with somebody else. That's your ministry. That's a ministry of reconciliation. What does rec to be reconciled with? It means that the estranged relationship is now healed. Oh my God. That's 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 what what John what what Jesus was was telling Nicodemus in the Gospel of John in uh, chapter three. And chapter three, when he said, Marvel not that I said, you must be born again. Uh, janao, Anna Janao means in another way. Janao means Genesis, to generate. So when he says be born again, it means be born in another way or in another dimension. Genesis, be born from the original. Now, here's what I like. Be reunited with your relative from above. I want to lift my hands and say, Father, I, I want to lift my hands and say, I worship you, God. I want to lift my hands and say, I worship you, Lord. But I love it when I lift my hands and say, I worship you, Father. Come on, somebody lift that hand to the Lord and say, Father, I worship you. Good God from Zion, Heavenly Father. Ooh, listen, think about how we address him. Lord, we come before you. We come before you, Heavenly Father. My, 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 my. So, he says in the second verse, and do not be conformed to this world, the cosmos, the system, the system. Don't be conformed because you see, if you're like everybody else, then you can't make a change. When you're different, you stand out. Doesn't mean like you have to walk around with a big sign that says Jesus. That's fine if you want to do that. Or we, you always have to wear a t-shirt that says Jesus or I belong to God. That's fine if you want to do that. But let me tell you something, you could, you could look just the way everybody else looks in one sense of the word, your style, the way you talk, the way you, I mean, the way you dress, you can look cool and stylish and everything, but something on the inside of you is different. And let me tell you something, at some point that's going to emanate, it's going to come out, people are going to see that. You, you know what, you may not even, you may not even, <laughs> people may not even know by what you have stated. Like I'm a Christian, I go to church or you know, I believe in God. Do you know that the life of God in you, when it's nurtured, like what we're doing right now, studying, worshiping, praying, spending time in God's presence. Let me tell you something, that, that, that divine energy and divine life on the inside of you will reach out and touch other people. It will affect other people's lives. I'm telling you, they'll, they'll say it's something different about you. It's not because you walk around and you, 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 you look, I'm not sure what looking holy is. I know there should be a, a particular standard. Um, you know, there are limitations, but holiness is not what you wear. Holiness is what you are. Holiness, as I stated in the beginning of the class, is what God makes you, is what God does on the inside of you. It's more than, oh, I don't do anything bad. I don't do anything bad. Nah, the essence of holiness is he's emphasizing, he's emphasizing, God emphasizes his signature upon your forehead. So he doesn't want us to be conformed because anybody can be a copy. Did you hear me? But the world loves an original. And let me tell you something, you are an original. You are official. That's why Ephesians chapter one says you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? 
The king has stamped his ring on your forehead. He has put his seal on your forehead. That means you are authenticated by God. You are official. You are ratified. Nobody can take out of you what God has put on the inside of you. And that's why you need to know what God has put on the inside of you so you can take advantage of it. The purpose of revelation, the purpose of illumination is exploration. You want to, you want to, you want to explore your territory, what God has given you as a child of God in general, as God has given grace to everyone, but then specifically you sister, you brother, because you have a unique place. Uh, to fill in the body of Christ. You have a unique place to fill in the body of Christ. Amen. That's a beautiful cat lady, T. That's a beautiful pet. All right then. So, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Everybody say, I'm called to be a transformer. Well, let's say it this way. Let's put first things first. Say, I'm called to be transformed. You're welcome, sis. I am called to, God has, say this with me. God has called me to be transformed. See, that's change. Whenever you hear that word transform in this verse, it comes from the word metamorphosis. And what is metamorphosized? What, what insect do we know uh, transitions from one state to another, I mean completely different, the caterpillar. Can you imagine that caterpillar slinks along on its belly and just moves like that? Then uh, uh, and at some point when it's time for that caterpillar to change, it develops a cocoon. I like, you be I like that because God cocoons you in his mercy. Ooh. God cocoons you in his grace. See why he's changing you, watch me. Philippians 1 and 6, he who began the good work in you. Look at somebody and say, it's an, in, it's an inside job. Don't even worry about what God's doing with me. That's God's business, and it's an inside job. Amen. That's right. Nobody's business. Your, your spiritual growth and the way you develop as a child of God is between you and God. Uh, the preachers and the teachers can add to your development, but nobody's called to judge you because you didn't pray like somebody else or sing like somebody else. You are who you are, amen, by God's grace. So God wants you to be transformed. And this is the powerful thing by the renewing of the mind. And that's the word of God that, that listen, listen, you could be completely out of spiritual Egypt, but if your point of reference is always back to what you, to where you used to be, you can't look in two directions at the same time. And the devil knows this. That's, that's his weapon. That's his strategy, mind games. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 6, having done all to stand, stand. Stand against the wiles of the devil. It comes from the root word that deals with the mind. And the devil wants you to stay a slave in your mind. How do you stay a slave in your mind? You are always worried about what somebody thinks about you. You always worrying about what somebody might be saying about you. You always hung up on your negative past. You're always, you're always, uh, you know, because the, the, the devil can whisper in your mind. He'll throw thoughts in there and wait for you to respond. He can't read your mind. Your, your mind is sac sacrosanct. It is holy. That God does not allow the devil to read your mind. I want you to understand that. He can throw a thought in your mind and then wait for you to respond. I, I don't know about you, but I want to become unpredictable to the devil. There's, there's, there's times when I have been predictable. You know why? Because some of us are blessed. I'll call it this. Some of us are blessed with a very vivid imagination. Lord have mercy. Thank God for his grace. Who mercy. I have such a vivid imagination. You can, you can, you can run through mental images you could run through mental images in your mind, conversations in your mind. You can play through scenarios in your mind that are not even happening, that, that probably won't happen. 
just like a movie screen. You, you're walking down the street and you're running through all these kind of imaginations. You're huffing and puffing, not because you're walking fast, but because you're imagining what might happen or you're, you're recalling what somebody did to you and you're replaying that thing over and over again. See, Satan is a strategist. He has studied humankind for 6,000 years. He is a military tactical genius. Why do you think every time you get ready to come on a platform like this, or every time you get ready to open your Bible or pray or study, Satan will remind you of something negative that will attack you, that will, that will attack your emotions. Something negative. And you'll be like, yep. Yeah. Man, that's sure. And you will find yourself, if you're not careful, you'll re- you'll find yourself repeating what's on your mind and the thing is not even real. Yes, many times the enemy will go throw that thought. He can't read the sister's mind. He can't read the brother's mind, especially those who are born of the spirit. He keeps your soul. He can't read it. He can only throw a thought and then kind of, because he studied us, he will try to predict what you might, you know, She did this the last time. He did this the last 20 times. So if I throw this thought again, they're probably going to respond the same way. Well, guess what? I'm not going to be conformed. I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind because I know Satan's strategy is to remove my mind. And I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. But no vacancy, Satan. No vacancy. You can't park here. You may throw something, but you're not going to park here. You're not going to stay there. You know why? Because I'm going to renew my mind with the truth of God's word. And it's the renewing of my mind, the renewing of my mind with truth. That's like I. That's why I love to repeat who you are in the Christ. I like to say it over and over again that you are more than a conqueror. That greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I want to repeat that. You know why? Because there are many voices in the world. There are many voices in the world. That's right, sister. And the devil don't have any new tricks. He plays the same tricks he played with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God didn't say, did God say, starts you to question, starts having conversations in your mind. But you know what? Try something new. The the next time the devil throws the throws a thought in your mind. Sometimes it could be, it could come from your past. If, if you've been through a lot of um, harmful relationships, if you've been hurt a lot in a certain, certain way, if you may have struggled with certain kinds of habits or whatever your past, maybe come from a broken family, whatever the situation may be, life has a tendency to do a job on us. That's why I'm thankful for God's mercy and God's grace. And life, life will try to write upon us and script us. Life will try to determine us. This is the way you're going to be, and this is the way you're going to be all the time. Remember what happened back then? Now, nah, I'm not going to live in my past. I'm not going to live. I'm not going to become a prisoner of unprofitable history. You know why? Because there's because I'm connected to the omnipotent one, then my, my potential is omnipotent because I'm connected to the omnipotent one. And if God is not reminding me of my negative past, then why are we giving the devil the, the, the pleasure or the authority to dwell on something that God is not dwelling on anymore? He said, I have redeemed you from your history. That's what being a new creation is all about. And then when you are renewing your mind with the truth of the scriptures, I gave you two good verses of scripture. One that comes from Romans chapter eight, we are more than, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors means that God fights for us and he gives us the victory. So we, we oh, fighting the good fight of faith is not trying to win. Fighting the good fight of faith is executing the victory that God has already given us. And when you, when your mind is renewed to that, oh, come on, the devil has lied to the world and the world has eaten it up. The devil has made the world think that his garbage is 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 gourmet food and they eat it. That's the art of deception. But when your mind is renewed with the truth of 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 of, of God's word, I love what Deaconess uh, put in the chat last week. She said the word how sweet it is. Oh, that's what I like to hear. Now, God wants to use you, daughter. God wants to use you, son, as you are transformed, just like Ephesians says. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. So if we are already blessed, if we are already blessed, then God wants us to be a blessing. God wants us to be a blessing. That's why God blesses you because he wants an investment return. Did you know that's why God loves to perform a miracle in your life? Did you know that's why God is not going to forsake you with the prophecy he's spoken over your life? I don't care how long it has tarried. I don't care how long it has, it has been delayed. If God has spoken something regarding your life, it's going to come to pass because God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that, she, that he should repent. Has he not spoken it and will he not bring it to pass? So I want to renew my mind. Now, once I'm transformed, that of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a lifelong process. We, we do what we do because we either inherited it, we are taught it, or we pick it up from society. And some of those things sometimes are so deeply ingrained. Sometimes they are so deeply ingrained that it almost takes a miracle for God to disrupt those things. It takes the miraculous hand of God. And that's why the word of God, that's why we can say with confidence that the word of God works the miraculous, all right? So be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove or discern what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Everybody say it's time to renew my mind. Say it again, it's time to renew my mind. When my mind is renewed, I have engaged in the most powerful thing, one of the most powerful things that can happen in my life. I am transformed like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. I am transformed. I am changed. Old emotional hangups can't hang on me anymore. Old weak ways can't dominate me anymore. What people think about me does not dictate my movements. Whatever my past has been, whatever my mistakes has been, have been, they are in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered anymore by one stroke, by one wave of the hand, by one shedding of the blood, even though the pangs of the feelings of guilt and condemnation may try to creep back because of past mistakes, but then I'm, I renew my mind with Romans chapter eight, verse one. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah to God. It gives me confidence at the throne of the Lord. It gives me confidence at the foot of the cross. Amen. And so he says, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God wants you to be a transformer. He wants you to help change other people. Now, this is why Hebrews chapter 11, oh, I'm, let me emphasize the word that I wanted to emphasize. Boy, it seems like it takes a while for us to get here. And then when I get here, the time is gone. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want you to underline that word, that statement, will of God will of God it is the word thelema, and it means the intention of God, the purpose of God, the good pleasure of God, God God's reason, God's, um, God's design. That's the will of God. And I want to tell you, I'm going to say this because this bears repeating, the will of God is the safest place to be. The will of God is like dwelling under the shadow of the Almighty. Because when you're dwelling under the shadow of the Almighty, you can say like the psalmist in Psalm 91, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. Now, this is very important because very often in, in uh, I guess most of Paul's letters, he would open up his letter by saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, come on, by the will of God. Somebody say, by the will of God. And he would, he would say that, he, even before he would start teaching the letter or writing the letter, he would use that statement, Paul, an apostle, 
by the will of God, not by the will of man. Now, it, it didn't come from human will. It came from God's will. And God's will is the safest, most prosperous place to be because it means whatever happens, God will turn it and work it for my good. I'm going to say that again. When you're in the will of God, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 will become a reality. All things work together for good. That means God doesn't waste anything to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. Now, conforming to the image of Jesus Christ is different from conforming to the world. Because when you conform to the world, you ain't changed. You just do everything you do. You have no, you have no other answer. You have no other point of reference. You have no other point of reference when, you're, when the world is your source. But when you are transformed, by the word of God and the word of God is your source. You are grooving and moving in the good, acceptable and perfect will of God. And again, that's why Hebrews chapter 11 and verse one is so powerful. Faith is the substance of thing. It's my ground of confidence of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So Paul would say, I am what I, I am, a, I am an apostle by the will of God. In other words, that was his defense. That was his offense. That was his confidence. That was his assurance. It was his defense. So when the devil or people came against him and spoke against him, that's what I'm going to protect myself with. I am what I am by the will of God. I'm in the will of God. And it was his offense when he went forward to do the work of God. I am God's will. So wherever God's sending me, I may have to go through the trial and the tribulation sometimes, through the shaking and the breaking. But guess what? I'm going to make it and I'm going to come out on the other side better than when I went in. Amen. Doesn't matter what goes on. God's going to take it all. Tragedy, loss. God's going to take it all and work it. Work it together. He's going to take the ingredients like like, like chocolate and salt and sugar and flour, not just one at a time, but he's going to join it all together and put it in that hot oven. It may be hot for a little while, but when it comes out, it's going to be a delicious cake. Maybe that's kind of a trite uh, analogy, but it's good. Put all those ingredients together and wow. each ingredient doesn't taste good by itself. The ingredients, the ingredient, that one, you know, I'm not going to eat cocoa, or, or, or bitters by itself. You're not going to eat the flour by itself. But once you mix it together, good God from Zion, when you put it in the oven, the oven is hot. The oven is so oh. hot that it may be uncomfortable, but the cake ain't going to stay there forever. When it comes out, we got a witness on the line. Amen, Deacon this Brown. When, when it comes out, it may be hot and uncomfortable, but you ain't going to keep the cake in there forever because then it would burn up. And God's not going to let us burn up. Come on, fiery furnace dwellers. Hello. Come on, Hebrew children. Hello. Amen. But he's going to, it's going to come out. And when it comes out, it's going to be a good cake. So let, so being in the will of God means things are going to work together for our good. And, and that was Paul's offense. That's how he went forward to do the will of God. And then it was his confidence. I can't always, I can't predict the future. Sometimes the, the best that I can do is to put one foot in front of the other. Even, it, even if it feels like um, the Lord himself was sake, forsaken me. That's why David gave us the encouragement. He said, I'm, I was, I'm young and I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. That's why David said many of the afflictions of the righteous, many. Can I get a witness on the platform? Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of half of them. No, out of most of them. No, out of all of them. See, now, now, now watch, now watch. Why is it important for me to say this or for teachers and preachers to say this? Because preaching and teaching is like sowing seed. You get what you plant. Ooh, Lord. That's why I like to preach about healing and deliverance and help also taking us through trial and tribulation. But if you always talk about what God delivered you from, we need to know that. But man, you want to know what my burden is? I don't want to major on what the Lord delivered us from. I want to major on what the Lord delivered us into. He didn't bring us out of Egypt. 
to dangle in the wilderness. Nah, he brought us out of Egypt to go through the wilderness into the promised land. I wish I had a witness right now. Amen. And the promised land is being blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I need to know what my, my artillery is. I need to know my artillery. I need to know what I have. I need to know what my spiritual bank account contains. I need to know what my inheritance is. I need to know what my equipment is. I need to know what God clothed me with. Yes, sir. I need to know what kind of hat I'm wearing. I need to know what kind of belt is around my waist. I need to understand the robe of righteousness. I need to understand the garment of praise. So, so when I'm when the spirit of heaviness tries to dominate me, I can lift my voice up like a trumpet, even if I don't emotionally feel it at the moment and say, God, I Thank you, because even as your servant said, uh, many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. I'm quoting the word of God back to the God who gave it to me. In the first place, the will of God, the will of God is the safest place to be. And even when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, do you understand? That's why I love Jesus. That's why I love the Lord, because he is the theanthropic person. He is, he is theos, he's God, theanthropic, but he's also human, anthropos, man. He's human. He's completely man, completely God at the same time. He's human, completely human and completely God at the same time. He knows my feelings. He doesn't just identify, if you hurt, I may be able to identify with you because I've gone through a similar situation, but I can't feel what you're feeling because you're you and I'm me. Your emotions are yours, not mine. I am empathize with you and sympathize with you, but I serve a God who knows exactly what I feel. He doesn't just empathize. He feels what I'm feeling. That's why he's the perfect mediator between God and man. He's the perfect mediator because he's God. He holds hands with deity. He's a human being. He holds hands with humanity and he joins the two impossibilities. That's why when you don't know how to pray, you don't know how to say it, you don't know how to lay it out. God knows exactly what you're trying to say. And the Holy Ghost of God picks up on that. And he interprets your groan and your moan. He interprets your anguish. He interprets your frustration into a prayer. And high priest Jesus gives it to the God, to the to God the Father. And that's why sometimes you're going to find a prayer answered. You're going to see a prayer answered. I didn't know I prayed in this, this detail. It was the Holy Ghost praying through you. There's times when we've been in our life when we can't even utter a word. We just sigh. We're so frustrated about what we see in the world. That's a form of prayer. We look at the news. We see suffering children and death all around. And we don't even know what to say to God. But that very anguish on the inside of you is a form of prayer. And because you are filled with the Holy Ghost, he interprets that groan. As long as you stay current with the Father in his word, in praise, in prayer, he will use your human spirit to help others and to intercede you into the perfect will of God. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. His humanity was rebelling against the cross never having been separated from the from the father never having been separated from the from the holy spirit he wasn't afraid to die as a martyr there had been many martyrs who died but there was not a time in all of eternity when god manifested as flesh because he fell in love with his human creation he fell in love with his human creation. He fell head over heels with you, daughter. That's why he calls you not just a creation, but he calls you his daughter. He calls you his son. He works for you. He fights for you. He's on your side. The devil has lied to the world. God is mad at you and your sins are going to find you out. And he's just waiting over you to crush you. That's what mercy and grace is for. He knows the steps we take a million years before we take them. God's going to buy back some time for y'all. I'm telling you, the, jo the prophecy of Joel is going to come to pass. I, God knows how to restore the years that the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locust and the caterpillar have eaten. You know why? Because God knew the steps we were going to take and he figured in the time. 
for every setback, every cutback, every pushback, everybody who said get back, and the devil who was saying stay back now, nah, watch me thrust you forward with my anointing, with my mercy, with my will, with my grace, with my miracle working way. And when I do it, there's going to be a testimony all up in your mouth and you're going to tell everybody just how it happened. And they're going to say, can I meet this Jesus? Can I meet this God? And they're going to say, I've never seen it on this wise. You will declare, come on, daughters of Zion, you will declare it is the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. And they will go, ah, I love the fragrance. I love the sound. I will partake of this rose. Jesus said, if there's any other way to redeem mankind, I don't want to be separated from you. He was so stressed out that the blood vessels in his forehead broke and he sweat drops of blood because the, the blood fell, went into the sweat ducts. And he, it's called hemohydrosis. He was on the verge of a major stroke because he rebelled against being separated from the father. But three times he said, God, is if there's any other way to redeem mankind, let this responsibility, let this calling pass from me. But then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Because no matter how drastic and no matter how terrible this seems at the moment, I may have to take up my cross. I may have to get on my cross, but just watch out. It may be Friday, but I'm going to tell you something. Resurrection is coming. On the other side of that suffering is going to be a resurrection. And when I come out of the grave, I'm not coming out by myself. Because Ephesians chapter 2 and say, says that we were raised together. Y'all better hear me now. Don't wait to get to heaven to get with Christ. He said we were raised together. When he was raised from the dead, he didn't come out by himself. He took, that's why he's called the firstborn of many brethren. He took you by the hand, Brother Whiteley. He took you by the hand, Deaconess. He took you by the hand, Lady T. He took you by the hand, Charmaine and Michelle. He took you by the hand, Anna. He took you by the hand when he raised up. And if you were the only person on earth, he would have grabbed you by that hand, took you out of the grave, called you by your name, just like he called Lazarus and brought you out of the grave. And he said, not only am I gonna bring you back from the dead, but I'm a stamp on your forehead that you are authenticated by my love and by my grace. And not only that, I'm going to give you a ministry that nobody else has. I'm going to give you a purpose and a calling that nobody else has. And as I am preparing you, when I call you, I will clothe you. And when I clothe you, I will commission you. And when you go, you're not just going, you're being sent. And when you are sent, you have my authority. You have a right to speak. You have a right to pray. You have a right to praise. You have a right to expect that my hand is going to move if a thousand falls at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, you make sure you dwell in the secret place of the most high God. Don't occasionally visit. Stay there. Lord have mercy. Stay right there. What do you mean? It's a minus term. Stick your claim in the promise of God. Stick your claim in the book of God. Stick your claim in the presence of God. Stick your claim in prayer and stick your claim in everything that God has promised for your life. God left us on the earth to be a witness. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The word of God, preaching and teaching, reinterprets the circumstances. It redefines your potential. It redefines your outcome before hope was present. And that's why preaching and teaching is so powerful because preaching and teaching the word of God, listen to me, we're talking about faith. It's a faith trigger. It's a power trigger. It's, it's, a, it's a hope trigger, amen. It's a potential trigger. Your, your, your history is not your potential. Your history is what you've already done. Potential is what you can do. If you're, if you're in God, if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things have become new, amen. I hope this helped you. We'll have to do, uh, faith is a verb next week, or we'll call it part two for the sake of those that'll go to YouTube and watch this. Lord, I pray that some, something was said today that has encouraged your people, has encouraged your daughter, has encouraged your son. 
those that may be in need of you later on watching this, who never accepted you as your Lord and Savior, accepted you as their Lord and Savior. You can pray this prayer with me right now. If you've never done that, you may not even fully understand it. You don't have to fully understand it. To simply accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Just open up your heart according to Romans 9, verse 9 and 10. Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. Lord, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you were raised from the dead for me. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. Come into my heart and my life as my personal Lord and Savior. Fill me, Lord, with the Holy Ghost. Make me a new creation. Thank you for signing my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you for signing your purpose in my life. I accept you now, Lord. And I thank you that just that quickly, I now am your child. And you are now my heavenly father. I belong to you and you belong to me. Let your will be done in my life for it is the safest place to be. I speak blessing to you, children of God. I speak blessing to you, sons and daughters. I speak blessing to you, uh, favorites of the father. You are the father's favorite. I speak a new day to you. I speak a fresh anointing over your life. I speak healing to all the cells of your body. Whatever you're struggling with in pain and affliction and ailments or diseases, God make you whole now in Jesus' name. God supply your every financial need and heal your heart from every hurt. God help you in your family matters and may he move in miraculous ways into your situation and circumstance. And God use you for his glory. God anoint you for the task at hand for your particular assignment on this planet earth. God give you hope in the day of trial and know that the best is yet to come. God is not through with us, church. The great and good days stand just ahead. The prophecy of Isaiah is, is, is coming to pass. Arise and shine for thy light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon, upon thee, though we are surrounded with gro gross darkness. It is in the darkest times that the light shines the brightest. Jesus is the light of the world. He lives in us. May God grant you his choicest apostolic benediction as I decree and speak over you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide upon you, the people of God, henceforth, now, and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And we say, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Have mercy upon our nation and our surrounding communities. Have mercy upon us as a people. And may your word and your truth and your hope and mercy prevail in America and the nations of the world. This is our prayer. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. God bless you, saints. We can unmute and just say hallelujah or amen. I hope you receive amen. something. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. 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 Amen. Amen. <laughs> she tells me I'm showing up. I'm singing unto the Lord a new song. Oh yeah. The Lord oh, bless yeah. you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. Thank you, um, uh, people of God, for joining us. We love you. We're a family. We thank God for Pastor Cooper, all the ministers, the deaconesses, and ministers that are online now, um, and the deacons. God bless you. God bless your ministry. And we will see you later. Do your good homework. Read uh, Hebrews 11 and the verses that we said tonight. One of your assignments is when a verse is quoted, whether we go there uh, proper or quote it, try to write it down and then go over those scriptures during the week along with what you already do. The Lord bless you is my prayer for you. Amen. God bless Amen. you. Amen.